This is Star Talk. Neil deGrasse Tyson here, your personal astrophysicist, and this is going to be a Cosmic Queries edition. I don't know if you know the history of this. We 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 did it on a lark uh, some years ago because questions would show up in our inbox, and we said, why don't we sort of staple them together and make an episode out of it? And it turned out to be very successful. Our fan base loved it, but then we got like greedy about it. And now you can only ask questions officially if you are a member of our Patreon network. And so, at, but you, you can do that at the lowest entry level that we have, which is like $5 a month. Uh, I got with me my co-host, Paul Mercurio. Paul, how you doing, man? Hello, Neil. Great to be back. Yeah. Doing great, man. Yeah, Good I think $5 you. a month, everybody should be able to have $5 yeah, a month. You know, you should, uh, unless you're going to the track. And, uh, you know. <laughs> the track. <laughs> the track still exists. <laughs> yeah, that's $5. That's a cup of coffee at Starbucks. Come yeah, on, I know. That's right. That. That's all. I'm saying. For a month, right. That's For all. Month. That's, that's all. all that is. One less coffee, that's all. <laughs> well, today we are, we are orbiting the solicited Cosmic Queries around the expertise of a friend and colleague from across the pond, Natalie Starkey. Natalie, welcome back to Star Talk. Oh, thanks for having me. It's always good to join you guys. We love the accent. We oh, love the accent. Oh my gosh, we love it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Can't help it. <laughs> I don't feel that sophisticated right now. Yeah, yeah, all, yeah. We just feel so inadequate. When... <laughs> I know, exactly. <laughs> um, so let me remind people of Natalie's expertise. So she, as I said, not only a friend of Star Talk, she's an ace science communicator, and she's a science media producer at the Royal Society of Chemistry in Cambridge. That would be Cambridge, England. Yeah. Uh, she's written two books, Catching Stardust, I love it, and Fire and Ice. And that has a paperback edition that's coming out very soon. And she wrote our planetarium show here in New York City at the American Museum of Natural History. And that show is called Worlds Beyond Earth. I so, see, I've seen that show. And that, I remember saying to myself, there were flaws in the show and I wanted to talk to you about it. <laughs> Hang on a second. Well, what did you mean when you said... So this oh, is no. the right moment for this, yes. All right. <laughs> Uh, so, Natalie, remind us what Catching Stardust was about. Was that the Stardust mission? Uh, well, it, it does feature within it because I worked uh, a little bit on the Stardust mission when I was doing lab work, um, but it focuses mostly on comets and asteroids just in general. So I look at some of the missions that have been to comets and then talk about sort of the past, the history of comets and asteroids, and also then going to the future. What are we doing with them in the future? How are we going to divert them from colliding with Earth or how are we going to use them to mine them for precious metals and things? Now, you realize there was a hit, best-selling book and hit movie on exactly this subject all right there, uh, there's been many books no, but, no, no, yeah. sorry, not just the collision <laughs> part but uh, uh i think michael crichton's first novel was the andromeda strain oh where, was it okay i think it was where there's a piece of sort of space dust that we captured and brought back to earth because wasn't the stardust mission we brought comet dust back to earth um, yeah, so Stardust, yeah, that was the first sample return mission from a comet. So, so yeah, yeah. We, yeah so, exactly. So as any good science fiction movie or story unfolds, we go into space and something bad happens. So, <laughs> right. That's the whole plot. That's right. <laughs> well, it wouldn't really be much of a movie to stay and watch. It's like, well, we went to space. Everybody was very pleasant and they gave us tea. And then we left. <laughs> they gave us tea. <laughs> and we analyzed the sample in the lab. Let's catch up with what's in right. the lab. And nothing exactly. happened. Exactly. Uh, so you didn't bring back any any killer bugs, I guess. Unless no, no. that was COVID. <gasps> <sighs> it was We're far too long ago. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, but they did bring back amino acids, which is really cool. So like uh, what a lot of people don't realize is that comets and asteroids contain um, basically the building blocks for life. And so actually they measured um, glycine, which one of, is one of the amino acids within the cometary samples that were collected by Stardust. Um, they didn't know it at the time. They were worried it was actually contamination that had been brought about from the scientists handling the material. But then since then, we've analyzed other comets in space um, and samples of comets. And and we've seen it 
there again. So we know that actually the stuff that was on the Stardust samples was, was amino acids in space, which is really cool um, when you're thinking about life elsewhere in the solar system. So, so it's, it's, I mean, uh, you, you said it just casually, but it's a very big challenge to make sure that we don't contaminate the samples that we're analyzing. Yeah, and, and they say, "Look, there's DNA. Hey, look, there's the rhinovirus. Hey, there's <laughs> right. the, the right. you know, oh, they're frogs. You know, <laughs> right. <laughs> Why don't you have your gloves on? Uh, how many, uh, uh, how many times do I have to tell you this? <laughs> here's a box of Kleenex. You know, <laughs> <laughs> can you stop sneezing? On, on the dust is making me sneeze. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's a whole branch of NASA. I think uh, mm -hmm. they have a whole division called planetary protection where we don't forward contaminate where we're going to explore and yeah. we want to make sure contamination doesn't come back to earth precisely so yeah because if we send a spacecraft up into space and we want to land it on a planet or a moon or a comet or asteroid we don't want to then take bugs from earth and then put them on that place and go oh look we found these bugs here we need to know that that's perfectly clean before we do that so that's why we don't just go out and just put things on different planets and things. Um, that would be relatively easy to do, but we need to make sure that we're protecting where we're going. Um, and equally, the other way around, we need to make sure what we bring back doesn't end up with earth bugs on it and we don't know where they've come from. Right, so, so I'm at, glad, so that's at good. The risk, at the risk of a silly question, so the amino acids that were found, I know there are amino acids here because I hear about them. Are they different than the amino acids that exist on earth? Is Great question. Different? Really good question. Um, really? Actually, there's there's more amino acids in space than we have on Earth. There's more amino acids than we need for life as we know it. So actually, they now we've been analysing loads of different meteorites, which is just pieces of space rock that have landed on Earth and, and other um, samples from space. We've discovered a whole raft of amino acids, way more than we need. So um, it might be that they're not all needed for life, but they just exist anyway. Wait um, a minute, Natalie, I think you're taking the extra amino acids and making life forms of your own. Well, we maybe. <laughs> and that's what we're yet to find out. But we oh. know the potential's there, you know. So so in any of these oh. moons or comets or asteroids, maybe there's, you know, there are different forms of life that we we don't know at the moment. So, yeah, it's, it's there's so much out there. Her neighbors are like, is it me or are there like six or seven more people in Natalie's house than yesterday? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they're like, there's like an old man and a baby. And... No, there's someone trying to crawl out of the basement. You know, that's what. It is, <laughs> so how about um, there's another point here this is a little bit inside baseball but natalie that's an expression we use here in america when you're about to give detail that probably no one cares about oh okay because <laughs> there's a okay. tv show called inside baseball and you really have to be into baseball <laughs> right like just to watch it or near it at all so this is an inside baseball question as i remember my biology uh life on earth has a handedness to it not that you're right-handed or left hand but the molecules twist in a way that they could twist the other way but they don't and if they did we couldn't use it in our life forms anyway so on these rocks or in the stardust the comet dust do you have both do you have half twisting left and half twisting right so this is the chirality, isn't it? Chir chirality, chiral. that's the word yeah. I, was, I, was, I was grumbling um, for, And yeah. do you know what? This is so bad, but I can't remember um, what they found. But so basically, if you found that, we, are we left, aren't we, on Earth? I um, forgot. We're, yeah, left, I, here's my definite answer. We're either left <laughs> or right chir chirality, I'm sure of it. <laughs> so I can't remember. And I, I don't know whether it's really important that, you know, if we had the other handedness, um, whether we couldn't have a parallel life in that handedness or not. Um, but I honestly, I just can't, my brain has gone blank not having looked at this. It's my understanding that we could, but we just don't. It's just an yes. observed fact. Yeah, that everything is in one way. Paul, do you remember that, that uh, was it a potato chip or something that, that Frito-Lay made where it had, was had all the oil of any uh, normal chips, but you couldn't digest it because I think the the oh, molecule it, had a different chirality to it, it. It went through you, yes. It went through you, and the warning on the on the back of the package said um, may cause anal leakage. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> your body has no idea what to right. do with it, even right. though it's oil, right? Right. So well, thank, I, I, thank God we're talking about something I know now: anal leakage. So let me tell you. <laughs> When I was a young lad, uh... <laughs> so I think I think it's a, there's a whole fascinating sci-fi story waiting to be written about whether 
you have left-handed or right-handed chirality in a life form because that means you couldn't eat you could eat them but it wouldn't be nourishing to you right Right. okay so you could find lettuce somewhere but you'd be like this is lettuce is no good to me um but yeah no i i think that's another issue we have that we would need to develop experiments put out in space to actually be able to measure that so it's one step actually measuring whether you have amino acids and then it's another step figuring out more information about them so um and we're sort of in the first steps when we're going out to look at planets and things and i have a fast chirality story i'm pretty sure this is true that the the molecular form of the flavor for mint okay i think it's spearmint is the molecular form is identical to caraway except caraway has the opposite handedness and so when it intersects your taste buds your taste buds respond differently because of the different handedness of them so mint and caraway are 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 chemically identical which That's is very cool. really cool. Yeah. Well, let's get to some Q&A. So, Paul, <clears throat> yes. what do you have for us? Uh, did you collect these? Uh, I collected them myself. I okay. went through them. And uh, there's right. some really great questions. And, and we're going to start with Christopher Stowe in Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. Is there a relationship between active geology volcanism and a planet or moon having a magnetic field? Oh, Ooh. yeah, that's a great question. So um, generally, we think yes. OK, so we think that a, a, a body has to be active and activity means that you need to have heat within that body. Um, and that can create um, basically liquid. Uh, so we, we need a, a hot, rocky core usually. Um, and that can, can could create a liquid ocean underneath an icy crust like we see through many moons throughout the solar system. Um, we need that kind of activity and the movement of material. It doesn't have to be rock and water. It can be other um, elements. Um, and we think that needs to actually be there to create a magnetic field. Um, so we have seen magnetic fields all throughout the solar system, but they're not that common. Um, they're common on like some of the bigger planets. Um, and a cu- I think a, just a couple of moons we've detected um, these kind of magnetic Fields. But you can't just have a liquid. I mean, it has to be. Uh, it has to be conductive. Right? Yes. So, so a salty, in there a salty water um, right. can definitely do that. Um, a salty oh, um, ocean. So you're uh, saying it's not just that you have. It's not just that the place is hot. Is that there's a difference in temperature between places within the object, so that things convect and move. Yeah. Right? Yeah, so it's not necessarily boiling hot. It's just warm enough that you've insulated a crust and and then you can keep something warm enough that it's liquid and it can move. So there's heat below and and things move around. Um, Got it, got it, okay. And when it comes to cryovolcanism, doesn't there have to be a mantle below the... the, There has to be... So in other words, for that liquid to be able to not freeze so that even though you're on a super cold atmosphere... Listen to Paul showing off. He know, knows the word cryo volcanism. volcanism. I know he just put that in there, didn't he? <laughs> I looked. I looked up one word and I repeated it like a hundred times. You sound so knowledgeable. It's that very man good. does his homework. Man. Okay. All right. Yeah. So cryo volcanism. Um, generally, it's happening in places that are icy because we're talking about cryo being the ice part, and the volcanism is the movement of that material. So usually, underneath an icy crust, you've got um, a rocky core in the middle, which is warm, and then this kind of salty liquid ocean, and it's from there that you're pushing material out. Out. So it's that that mantle, as you call it, on Earth. Our mantle is made of rock, and it's below a rocky crust. But in on these kind of icy moons, um, the mantle is made of of water or methane or ammonia oh, or some other solvent, um, and and that becomes your your mantle. But it's just made of something different. I'd like that analogy because it's you're analogizing basically the physics of what it's doing rather than the. The, the composition, the yeah. The material itself. That's very, I love that. And then there was the pulls of the moons that allow the movement of that subterranean water so that it's not so, yet doesn't turn to solid as well right there's this sort of movement that happens that happens in moons around these giant planets like jupiter and saturn they are actually they wouldn't just be hot if they were not next to that moon um, not next to that big planet uh, they need to be pulled by the gravity of that planet as they go about their orbit and it's that rocky interior that's pulled and pushed and squeezed and the rock is grinding all against other bits of rock and it, it by friction heats up um, and then it creates that heat that makes that mantle liquid and then produces that activity so you know if if io for example wasn't next to jupiter it wouldn't be um the most volcanically active plant um object in the solar system 
But but I think what Paul was referencing was if it was if it was only Io and only Jupiter, then it would stabilize into just a tidally locked orbit, and then there'd be yeah. no heat drivers. But we have other tugging forces that, like you said, there's it's a it's a it's a push and a pull and a tug and a, 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 a everybody's trying to get a piece of the action. And yeah. the response to that is a deposition of heat. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, Paul, give me one more before our break. See if we can. You got it. Um, this is Connor Holm. Firstly, I loved Fire and Ice. You really make geology exciting. Oh, that's so good to I hear. I like the way that you. sounds. It's like, that's... we know it's not exciting. We need it now. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that is, is one of the problems. People think right. geology is really boring, and then they read right. about it. They're like, oh, no, that's Natalie, really that cool. is the highest compliment I've ever heard. Yeah, heard. absolutely. <laughs> it's a t- um, in a typical volcano, how how high is the pressure buildup and how is it measured? Does this vary between Earth and space volcanoes? Oh, that's a good one. I like one. that, but let's take a quick break. Okay. Actually, I, 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 I cheated there because I knew we didn't have time to answer it, but we could dangle the unanswered oh. question before the break. So Jeez. we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, more with our solar system expert, Natalie Starkey, when Star Talk returns. We're back, Star Talk Cosmic Queries. My co-host, Paul Mercurio. Paul, always good to have you, man. Thanks, great time, always fun. And friend of Star Talk, solar system expert, Natalie Starkey, coming in from the UK. Natalie, great to see you again. Yeah, good to be back. Paul, we, we dangled a question there, something about what's the difference in the pressures between like Earth volcanoes and space volcanoes. And that's an interesting fact, How and how is it measured? Uh, mm-hmm. So, Natalie, how do we how do, how should we think about the undercrust pressures that ultimately just blow a gasket? Yeah. So, actually, it's really dependent on the vol- the volcano you're looking at. Even on Earth, um, you get loads of different conditions. So, you've got some volcanoes that um, will erupt at lower pressures, and some that erupt at higher pressures. So, generally, what we're looking at is the amount of gas that's contained within the magma. And if you go to, for example, let's take Mount St. Helens, everyone's heard of that big volcanic eruption that exploded half the um, the national forest. Um, that would that had a lot of gas in the eruption and it, it was there for a higher pressure. If you go to somewhere like Hawaii, um, you're looking at Kilauea, that's at, at lower pressure. It's got less dissolved gas um, within the magma. What happens is as that magma rises with all those dissolved gases, they start to um, expand as, as just the pressure of the crust um, decreases and that magma gets thrown apart basically so that's what would create a very explosive eruption but um you've always got dissolved gases so even in Kilauea where it's not very explosive you're going to get quite high pressures so it varies a lot now when we go into space um you're basically then it's very dependent on the individual uh, place that you've gone if you've got a smaller uh, body or a big large planet we tend to only see activity on the smaller bodies. Um, so we've seen them on Mars. Um, we've seen quite big volcanoes on Mars. And we've got loads of volcanoes on Venus, um, which are actually still active today. We've recently discovered that there's still activity today there. Whereas the ones on Mars are, are dormant, obviously, or, or dead. Yeah, so we haven't seen activity on Mars for, you know, quite a while now, billions of years, I think. Um, uh, It's possible that it could one day have another eruption. It's very, very unlikely. But Venus, on the other hand, is is continually erupting. So it's really, really active, probably much more active than Earth. And um, those individual volcanoes, again, are going to be all all at different pressures. um, And it will just be at a point when it will erupt. But they're probably more similar to what we see um, in, in Hawaii, those volcanoes. Okay, so I have a task for Paul. Mm-hmm. Paul, I want you to invent, you know how we tap a keg? Right, we should yes. tap, t- figure out a way to tap a volcano. Okay. <laughs> so we can release the pressure so then it doesn't blow its head, okay? <laughs> okay. And, 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 and level cities that are at their base. And that's the thing, like with super volcanoes, you know, if they can release a little bit of pressure along the way with a little eruption, then um, it takes the the pressure off that big one happening. So when they say, oh, there's a Yellowstone eruption due, it's due, but, you know, it has little eruptions and releases bits of pressure along the way. So it just kind of extends that timeline to when that big one's going to happen. Maybe that big one never happens because it just along the way releases a bit of pressure. So maybe we should purposefully dig holes and let yeah. some pressure. <laughs> I, say, I have a, I listen, I have a new DeWalt cordless drill. I can, you just, <laughs> That'll do it. just drop me right in. And, <laughs> hey, let me ask you something. 
how much greater is the pressure than the baking soda volcano I made in fourth grade? Because that sucker spewed everywhere. Ooh. And I got to tell you, it ruined my mother's drapes. I was grounded for a week, literally. Mm. That's you, I can't believe I, you did that indoors. I did it outside um, in the garden on the grass, and it killed the grass. And I was in loads of trouble as well. So, my, yeah. I got in um, a lot of it's fun. <laughs> Quick question Is there a common reason is when volcanoes go dormant in space, is there a common is research shown a common reason for that or does it vary depending on the celestial body and other factors or i don't know well, wait paul are you a that patreon that member <laughs> <laughs> hang on a second i got five dollars go find a five dollars okay. put it in the piggy bank okay I think it's a good question. Um, so basically, in order for a, a body to be active in space, it's got to be warm. We, we spoke about that in the last segment. Um, we were talking about how we've got to have heat within a body to create activity, create movement of material within that body, whether it be rock or methane or water, whatever it is that becomes that that magma and lava on that of that particular body. So if that particular object cools down and um, it loses its heat for some reason it's just primordial heat a lot of bodies were just active because they had heat from formation because they formed from big um uh, kinetic um what you call it, uh, impacts in space and that created heat and um, they just lose that over time and they die they do all the volcanic activity dies off and they can no longer be active because they're not warm enough but then we go somewhere like jupiter where we've got this push and pull of the gravitational energy those bodies can be active for forever really because if they stay where they are and jupiter keeps going around the sun then they're going to keep being active so there's really no no time limit on that so can we say that mars it has just simply cooled off yeah. from its formation and so and it's smaller than earth it would cool faster and so now it's got no action left Exactly. And the same with the moon, it's even smaller. So it's just cooled off quicker. So Earth is sort of this, this really nice example. It's not too big that it became uh, ridiculously sized like Jupiter or something. And, and, and it's just not even a rocky planet any longer. It's just big enough to, to have kept its primordial heat. And it also generates its own heat. So it's kind of that really nice sweet spot of being able to be active, but not be too active. It's not too hot. And it's not too cold. So it's kind of, you know, the perfect planet, I think. Anyway, I think it's a nice so place Paul to be. It says the geologist we're in a sweet spot that gives us volcanoes earthquakes and tsunamis <laughs> yes. right. thank you natalie for exactly. pulling out a sweet spot right. okay right imagine being at her house hey there's going to be a hurricane this weekend i can't wait <laughs> that's a sweet spot <laughs> for a sweet her. spot uh all right what else you got paul give it keep keep it coming yep we got troy from virginia what are the current processes of detecting life outside of Earth? Would it be detecting radiation around an area that could contain food for different life forms, or is it something else? Oh, that's really cool. I love this topic. Yeah. Um, so one of the ways that we first go out into the solar system to look for life is not to look for life itself. It's to look for the environments that could host life. So we want to look for habitable environments. Now we think that um, includes liquid water because we we think from what we know about Earth, uh, all the environments we find life and where we think life started included liquid water and heat. So we go out to all these places, and this is why we're sending. Um, the JUICE mission, which launched just recently, it's looking at some moons around Jupiter that have those environments. They've got um, warm interiors, they've got liquid water, and, and these create what we call hydrothermal systems, which is what exists at the, the bottom of our oceans. And we think life actually started on Earth, potentially, at the bottom of our oceans, due, and where the heat is emanating from the Earth, and it's interacting with salty liquid water and creating nice environments for microbes to thrive. So that's where we going we're going to look for these environments and then we're going to go okay do, do these places host the right ingredients for life and then we will look for life because there's no point living for life it's really hard to see life because if it's microbial for example we're not going to be able to see that from orbit we're going to have to land on that planet we're going to have to drill in we're going to have to delve into an ocean to actually see microbes Drill, baby, drill. That's what we Well, I know. Okay. Dive down as submersibles. You know, that's complicated. Of course, if there's dinosaurs roaming on these places, we'd see that from orbit, fine. But but we don't expect um, to have dinosaurs roaming around. So we're looking for very probably small life, or it might have been life that doesn't, it's now died off. So we'd be looking for fossilized microbes, which is incredibly hard to find. So 
initially we're just going to look for environments like we've been doing on Mars. We're looking for those kind of, uh, you know, saline, um, watery environments that might have hosted life in the past. Um, and that's the best place to start. You don't expect to see fossilized microbes because they don't have like bones and teeth. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so in, the, in right. the geological record, we we have seen examples of where um sometimes you know stuff without or bones and everything has been preserved. Um, but it's incredibly, it's really uncommon. You've got to have perfect conditions of of deposition to kind of cover that stuff over and preserve it perfectly in that record. So it's not destroyed over time, right? Yeah, exactly. Right, right. I mean, you, you would need to be on the surface of a planet to find that, and you'd probably want humans there to be looking right bots and you know they're going to go and do a good job but you need you know humans and and that are in our superior intelligence to help find these things until ai becomes our overlords then they're our right, superior right. intelligence which is, which is about a week away why don't we why don't it's we next just week is out... it next week exactly. you know something yeah. ball it's <laughs> it's happening why don't we just set out some like like alien bait like a full spectrum radiation banquet like it's almost like a like a banquet on a carnival cruise where just people eat so much they fall asleep in their chair. So the aliens come, they eat the radiation banquet, they fall asleep, and then we trap them and then we study them. I mean, we, we do send radio signals out into space. Um, so this is assuming that aliens can detect our radio signals and understand what we're saying. But we we have been doing that and we've sent uh, messages out on spacecraft over time, you know, to go out there and just say, look, we're here. I don't know, you know, I'm not sure if that's a good idea because we don't know if these aliens are friendly or not, you know. In retrospect, that feels a little dangerous, but yeah. 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 But yeah, we do that. And, and you know, another way. So when we're talking about the solar system, it's one thing, because we can get to these environments, we can send spacecraft and investigate them. But you then get to the exoplanets. So these are all the uh, the, the objects around other stars, um, other star systems. So far away, we can't directly see them. So we're using a different type of science then to try and detect what might be going on. Initially, we're just looking for whether the planet is hot or cold um, and how close it is to its its star. Um, because if it's too far away, we don't think it would be able to host life. Is it too close? It'll be too hot. So we're looking for things that are kind of within a zone that might be able to host liquid water or are definitely have activity. But that's like the next step. A Goldilocks zone, yeah. yeah. The Goldilocks zone is sort of being a little bit disproven more recently because um, we're starting to now in our solar system see environments you know, way away, like Pluto, for example, not in the Goldilocks zone, but it's geologically active. And, you know, there is every chance that life could have started there um, because it's got all kind of the right conditions um, for, you know, very weird life to exist, but it could be there. A new species of dog, yeah. yeah who knows? <laughs> it's Labradoodles all over. Yeah. Labradoodles. It's, a species, it's a species of dog that cleans up after itself. Please, God, please. <laughs> Oh, wait, so Natalie, nice. you mentioned, you just slipped by, you mentioned it, we did an entire explainer on it, but just for those, this might be their first time hearing, use the word a juice mission. Could you just oh, yeah. spend a minute, just a minute on that before we go to the next question? Yeah, so the juice mission just launched recently. Um, it's a European space agency mission. And okay, so the acronym is really forced. It's um, Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer. Um, so you, you kind of have to think through that one for how they got juice out of it. Um, but it does work in some way. All the letters are there within those words anyway. Yeah, J um, Jupiter and I see ice and E Explorer. That's not too yeah. forced. Okay, they, they, it's not too We'll forced. give them that one. We'll give them a B force <laughs> on that one. All right. Um, but yeah, it's not going to be arriving at uh, the Jupiter system until 2031. So I think, you know, this is one of these crazy things about space missions. They set out and then it takes forever to get anywhere in space. Um, it's got to do some slingshots of Earth and to gain gravitational energy to get out to, to Jupiter. But it's then going to be looking at uh, Europa, Ganymede and Callisto, which are three of Jupiter's moons. And actually, NASA are going to launch, um, hopefully launch the Europa Clipper mission um, next year, I believe, which is actually going to then get... That's my understanding, to, next year. It's yeah. getting there ahead of um, Juice, which is a bit cheeky. It's like going to arrive a year <laughs> ahead, even though it launches later. Natalie, um, everything's not a competition. Well, we're, I think, you know... We're, we're sorry about 1776 you gotta <laughs> let it go let it go drop it oh my god we'll i'm sorry but just to clarify just to clarify if you do not launch with sufficient energy to go straight there then mm -hmm. you need the gravity assist through some you know multi-cushion pool shot uh in the solar system so it sounds from what you said that our 
a clipper mission from NASA will be on a larger rocket and it'll be able to go straight there and not have to rely on gravity yeah. assist, which eats time in the duration to the destination. Exactly. So, yeah, it just, it, and it's also with the, you know, orbital dynamics, it depends where the planets are, when everything launches, and then, you know, how far it is going to be to get to places and whether right. you can go in a straight line. Is the focus of the, what, I would imagine the focus of the two missions different, right? I mean, um, I mean it's really, it. really similar, which is really cool because they'll be complementary. Um, so Europa Clipper is only looking at Europa, um, but it's investigating the signs for life. And then um, the uh, JUICE mission is looking at all of those moons, um, investigating what their surface is, what the composition is, getting more information in detail, just imaging surfaces. We haven't got hugely um, detailed images of these places. Um, and then measuring things like um, particles that are coming off of the surfaces, um, discovering you know, what's underneath in their liquid oceans, because they all have liquid oceans. They all, I think they all have more liquid water than we do have on Earth. That's, that's so my understanding. That's correct. The total volumes. liquid content versus our oceans, right? It's, yeah. it's I think they have is more. It, is it Iowa that ha Io has a hundred mile deep? ocean or something like is that's probably europa io europa, is the sorry. really hot one so right, right, that's right. the weird europa. one all the others are icy there but yeah so they've got huge oceans um i think it might be ganymede that's the biggest one and it's actually bigger than mercury like yeah, it's, yeah, ganymede, it's a right, crazy that's right. big moon um right. i understand that james cameron's going to europa to see if there's anything that's at the bottom of the ocean <laughs> that he can uh, somehow make a movie out of so that should be really I'd, cool. I'd watch it <laughs> but I, I, but I, I, I'd want to start a movement. Any life forms we find on Europa, we should call them Europeans. Oh, right? Okay, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Completely. That's perfect. That's perfect. how we got to do that. Well, we have an explainer on that um, where if you wanted, people want to do a deep dive on it, uh, you can look it up on our website. So, Paul, give me one more before our break. You got it right here. This is uh, Ian Diaz uh, from North Florida. Uh, is it possible to get energy from a planet's core and if it isn't possible, how could we hypothetically achieve energy from a planet's core? I love that. And let's 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 do take that break. When we oh, come okay. back, we're going to find out what is the future of geoengineering and how much energy does Earth have to give, especially relative to other sources such as oil or perhaps even the sun when Star Talk continues. We're back for the third and final segment of Cosmic Queries, Star Talk. I got Paul Mercurio with me as my co-host and Natalie Starkey. Natalie has two books under her belt. Uh, we've done shows on each of those two books. You can yeah. dig them out of our archives. Uh, one of them is called Catching Stardust, the study of particles brought back to Earth from space and just dust everywhere where it matters when we think about life. And my favorite of those two, sorry to pick one of your children here <laughs> Natalie, <laughs> it's not fire, allowed. <laughs> fire and ice it's got a way cooler title i think i was um, gonna say can i just say we need to make that a musical fire and ice the musical right? <laughs> and then we have a volcano in neil like with nathan lane he comes singing and dancing out of the volcano uh, oh yeah you need nathan lane if it's going to be one of these <laughs> it's gonna so be and uh, fire and ice is will be coming out in paperback soon because that's well, the more recent yeah. of the two books. We look forward to that. And uh, and Paul, just I, I at the be at the top, I, I I forgot to tell people you you're you're a comedian on the Late Show with Stephen Colbert. I do, am. Do, I work do you help show. write his jokes? Like, how does this work? I I basically perform on the show. He he and I go back to the Daily Show together. I was a writer on the Daily Show. I worked on the Colbert Report, and I do a mix of things on the uh, Late Show. And I think that's where we first stand. met when I was that's a guest. Where we, that's where we met. And, yeah, uh, guest on the I, Colbert Report. I, yeah, I, I I didn't know you were in the green room, and I came in and tried to steal some of your snacks, and you. Caught that's not going to happen. Yeah, and that's not going to happen. <laughs> and uh, and yeah, and I have a podcast called Inside Out, which you've been on, and Paul McCartney and Stephen Colbert and a whole bunch of cool people. So uh, yeah. Okay. Okay, so just to be clear, the title of your podcast is Inside Out with Paul McCurry. Yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I should I should put my own name in there. Probably would help, right? That's yes. what it is. Okay. Yeah. You got uh, it. But yeah. So, All right. Um, so, so let's pick up where we left off. Okay. Uh, we, we dangled the question. And please remind us of what that question was. Is it possible to get energy from a planet's core? And, and if it's not, how could we hypothetically uh, do that? Achieve and plus, plus Natalie... If the core is really, really hot, then there are surely places between the surface and the core that are not as hot where you don't have to dig as deep and you can, in principle, still get energy from it. Isn't that right? 
Yeah, so I mean, the core of the planet is incredibly hot. I think it might be hotter than the surface of the sun. Most of this heat in our core is a leftover from four and a half billion years ago when the planet formed. Um, you've got all those impacts happening in space that built up the planets, um, and that kinetic energy was turned into heat, which was stored within that metal core. Okay, so you've got a lot of what we call primordial heat in there. But then you've got this mantle of rock that sits around that. Um, and actually that generates heat all the time because we've got lots of radioactive elements uh, sitting within the rock um, that decay over time and release little bits of heat, which when you've got a huge amount of rock that does that, creates a huge amount of heat for our planet. So we've got that initial heat and then we've got the heat we're always making. And that's about 50-50 in terms of the heat that our planet gives out. Now, because of physics, heat always wants to move from somewhere hot to somewhere cold, which is space. So it moves from the inside out and it keeps our planet active. Um, it creates volcanoes and earthquakes, um, but it also gives us our liquid water and it can create energy for us. So, you know, if we go to somewhere like Iceland, use all their electricity comes from geothermal energy um, and and they actually heat their roads um, using just the heat from the earth uh, because it's very very cold in Iceland and they have very icy roads so they just they just heat them because they've got all this excess energy which they don't have to generate that's the most badass thing I've ever read about that it's they, awesome. they, so they don't have snow shovels or they don't have to salt the road they well, they the do in some places, um, but in particularly in Reykjavik, because it's quite, um, you know, it's not a huge population in, in Iceland, but a lot of people do live in, in the capital city. Um, and, you know, they can just do that. They have all this excess heat, so they can just heat it. An interesting point is that they used to be run on fossil fuels, and they just made a determined effort to, for this shift. It's one of the more brilliant sort of uh, scientifically literate energy stories in the world. I mean, yeah, just... and they can do that because they are they're a volcanically active place. Uh, they sit on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, but they also have a hot spot underneath um, Iceland, which is just this kind of warmer area of the mantle um, that produces excess um, heat and excess volcanoes. You've got the same in Hawaii. Um, it's, it's a hot spot volcano. But you can you don't need to be near a plate boundary where you create volcanoes or near a hotspot to necessarily create geothermal energy. You actually just need to drill down, um, not even very deep. If you drill down a kilometer, um, you get a 25 degree increase in temperatures. Now, you don't even need that much increase to generate a little bit of heat. I don't know in, in the US if you have like air source heat pumps for your houses. We have, they're quite common here now. So we don't even you, know what that is. I've never so heard. So you're it. creating heat for your house. Um, I I have one. I, I actually have one. Do you? you would lie in my f No! I, I will show you a picture right now. It works at 30... Listen to me. I know something about science here. Focus. At 35... <laughs> At, at 35 degrees or above, this is a heat pump, so I don't use so much oil in my yeah. furnace. And it t if it's 35 degrees or above, there's enough moisture in the air. It's a reverse process. So it's like it's an air conditioning condenser that reverses its process. <laughs> it takes from the cold, the moisture goes through, and it turns it into heat. I am done. I finally said something that I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> All right. It's good. No, so it's you, really yeah, you don't need a huge amount of heat. Too. We have saved a ton of money. In all seriousness, in our house, we've saved a ton of money on oil with this. Yeah, it's paint. becoming very common in the UK that we're we're actually switching over to these in all new build houses. Anyway, that's kind of a, a, a tangent, but like basically, we don't need a ton of um, heat to actually create enough to to heat houses, heat hot water. In other words, you don't need to dig to the core of a planet to gain access to the energy that remains within the planet itself. Yeah, exactly. Right. So okay. we, yeah, and um, we need to do that more. Um, you mm -hmm. know, if we want to do that, it, it is environmentally, we, we've got to question it a little bit because we've got to dig into our planet and we've got to lay pipes, but, you know, then we wouldn't require fossil fuels, which would be great. Um, but yeah, it's just one form of renewable energy, which we're not really using, but Iceland have done it great. I think areas of New Zealand do it because um, they have a nice high heat flow as well. Um, but yeah, definitely, we, we take heat from our planet all the time. Very cool. Why, why right. don't we harness the energy that we expect to get to the center of a salted caramel core pint of Ben and Jerry's ice cream? Because when, you, <laughs> when you're working toward that core, you that's can a, really a, harness that. Top prayer. We'll get top people working on that, Paul. <laughs> All right. This is from William. Drilling down uh, to Lake Vostok in Ar Antarctica has been cited as an, as an analog for exploring ice moons like Europa. Can you tell us what was learned from Vostok. I love that. So what is Vo Lake Vostok, Natalie? 
So the really cool thing about these environments on Earth, uh, like Lake Vostok and there's some other areas in Antarctica we can look at, is that um, you've got these bodies of water that have remained sort of pristine since they formed. So they've been capped off with ice and you've got this, um, this water that's just stayed there the same and hasn't had any human interactions um, in all the years it's been there. And this is very similar to, you know, the places we look at like Europa or Ganymede or anywhere else where we've got these liquid oceans with this, this ice capping it. Not only just not, no human interaction, nothing has reached it, right? No other part of the biosphere has touched it, right? So these have been like, so if something's going to happen, it's all up to itself, right? Exactly. It's, it's this really close. Like isn't it like 16 million years ago? It was believed to have been sealed off like that long ago or even longer? Certainly on an evolutionary time scale. I don't remember exactly how, how long these have been capped off. But that's the, I, just, the only point of this is, it's it's like an analog, right? Is that what would you say? Yeah, so we mm -hmm. need analogs because it's incredibly hard to go out and actually investigate these places in space. Um, we spoke about that already um, in this episode. You know, it's we got to send spacecraft. It's expensive. It takes years to get these missions out there and plan them. So actually, if we can look at a similar environment on our own planet and compare it with those environments we think exist in space, then we can do a lot of the work before we even have to go out there and investigate what's there. So they become like a little comparative um, planetology experiment. Um, and and it, it just gives scientists a really easy way to do their work, although it's still relatively hard to get to Antarctica. But we can actually do that science before we go to Europa and we can make all the mistakes here and then figure out what we need to do in space with uh, very limited equipment. Have they found weird life forms? Do we know? What do we know? So what we know about, so we find lots of strange environments on Earth. Some of the strangest environments are at the bottom of our oceans um, where you find organisms living that just shouldn't be able to survive. There's no light. Um, it's incredibly dark and high pressures, very cold. Um, and these kind of environments are where we find microbes that we call extremophiles. They like extreme environments. Um, so humans and other animals that we see on the surface of the Earth couldn't survive down there. Um, but there are organisms that have adapted to those environments and and thrive there's a whole you know a whole colony of animals and, and bugs and things down there which um we just weren't expecting to find so, so gone is this constant this darwinian concept of the room temperature tide pool yeah where that's where you need the like i mean this, this it blows it right up blows it completely open yeah in fact life probably we think most likely started in one of these very extreme environments um, and so we've kind of developed to now think that we live in a very you know we can't stand extreme temperatures we humans are a bit rubbish in that respect so paul did, did you just call us wimp ass creatures <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think she did i and think I, she uh, did i think she did you know i did not shave for this i don't you know i <laughs> Can I just ask real quick, you talked about Lake Vostok being an analog, but is, is it, isn't it limited in some ways because you can only extrapolate so much because the host bodies are different, right? Earth is a different celestial body than, say, Europa, so you, there's only so much you can glean yeah. from that analog. And that's right? like with, with any science we do, that we have to start with a set of assumptions, and, and we always know there's going to be, you know, limits to the experiment, and, and that would be one of the limits. It's not the same place, but... It's it's pretty close, and in some respects, it's close enough that we can test out some of these theories um, before we go out into space. Hey, we don't do close enough in America. <laughs> <laughs> we do it right, or we don't do it at all. <laughs> there you uh, go. Do we want to go to another one more Ta question? We got time, or? a couple more. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. This is Chase. Uh, greetings, Dr. Tyson and Dr. Starkey. Chase from Indianapolis here. Uh, my question is, could you pump as much water in the ocean as is to be added per year by the melting ice and then put it in a rocket and ship it to Mars? Oh, so that we don't have, so that in the climate change, we don't flood the coastal cities. Thus, thus saving coastal cities and accelerating Mars projects. Wow, because okay. I bet the cost of picking up cities and moving them inland 50 miles is probably more than shipping water to Mars. Right, can we just over, we're overthinking it. Can we just get 500 million jugs of Poland Spring delivered to another planet? It's probably get it in bulk discount at Costco. You create, you brilliant scientists, you're always overthinking things. Yeah, that's true, that's true. Just ship it all out. 
So I think the first part of that question, I have no idea. But the second part is going to be the main issue, I think. I'm sure someone who pumps water might understand the first part a bit more. But the second part is going to be an issue anyway, because to launch bulk into space is the most expensive thing. So this is why when we design space missions, we make everything very small and light. The instruments we send um, usually are not very large. You know, some of them are literally the size of a shoebox. Um, obviously, some spacecraft are much larger, but they're made to be light because um, it's just very expensive. Uh, the more uh, rocket fuel you'll need to launch some mass into space, the more rocket fuel you'll need because you've got them more rocket fuel and it just is exponential. So you want to keep everything light. So launching water into space is never going to be a good idea. We, we, we have to do it. Um, but actually we limit it. So on the International Space Station, they recycle their urine because they don't have an unlimited supply of water. If we go to the moon and Mars, like we're planning um, to send humans out and, and create bases out there, they're going to need to find ways to generate their own water, either from uh, rocks on the surface of the planet and the dust, or um, from a passing comet or asteroid, we might mine it for water. That's actually going to be much more efficient than trying to launch the stuff off our own planet. So that is a massive problem. So, Paul, I think the answer is no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, and, Chase. That's a big no, buddy. That's, that's, uh, a, that's a total no. And I, last I heard, the cost to launch a pound of anything in a payload is somewhere between five and $10,000. So the, the rate at which the ice is melting per pound times $10,000, you know, that's just, it would be prohibitive. I'm, I'm, yeah. I, I, I so feel quite sure that. So let's do that calculation. That. What did it cost... Uh, uh, Bezos to launch William Shatner. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get the calculator out. Can we, uh, uh, you want to do another question? Yeah, yeah. Let's get, keep okay. coming. This is, this is Kayla Hunter. Hey, guys. Uh, what would happen if a volcano erupted on the moon where the gravity is at 0.16 G? Would the lava float in the air or up and out into space? Ooh. Really cool. So, so, so I, let, me, let me sharpen that question. So the thrust of ejections from volcanoes, might, might they be fast enough to achieve escape velocity for the moon? Or will it just be like a volcano in slow motion where things go up and fall down slowly? So yeah, it, it can definitely happen. Like we see on um, Enceladus, uh, its volcanoes um, throw out material in plumes and some of that material ends up making Saturn's E-ring. So one of the rings, I think it's the second one in um, on that goes around Saturn, the material for that ring comes from Enceladus's volcano. So it did achieve escape velocity. It did, yeah. Yes, okay. Now okay. Um, on the moon, we've had loads of volcanoes uh, but about three billion years ago they all sort of stopped now we had usually um they were quite basaltic in composition so this is the same kind of uh volcanoes as we get in in iceland and hawaii very um flowy they're, they're very not very viscous um so they don't have a lot of energy to explode out um they just kind of flow over the surface in, in natalie valleys. is that an official word flowy is that flowy. A... Yeah. Flowy, I think so. <laughs> okay. that's I the like name it. that's the name of her labrador <laughs> the one she the one she's breeding on the planet Pluto. Yeah, okay, yeah. Exactly. All right. It's part part of that whole creepy breeding process she has going on in her basement. In her right basement, now. yeah, okay. With the microbes. Um some of the uh, eruptions on the moon were more explosive. Actually, towards the end of volcanism on the moon, um stuff was less flowy, let's say, and uh, and actually became much more explosive. Um and we got um fire fountains. So I don't know if you remember there's been quite a few fire fountains and eruptions on Earth in the last few years. Um, La Palma had some, uh, I think, a couple of years ago. L La Palma, the Canary Islands? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh, I don't know if you remember, it was all over the news, 2021, um, mm -hmm. huge fire fountain eruptions. And that actually would have happened um, on the moon back in the day, about 3 billion years ago. So, but again, they the magma is too heavy, it's too dense in order to kind of escape the moon moon surface. But um, generally, it all just rained back down. So yeah, in general, it won't be out floating around in space. Is it different for cryovolcanoes? Is it different for something that's sort of emitting sort of ice and... Yeah, definitely. So gases will definitely, you know, be able to escape much more easily because they're lighter. Um, but 
it really depends on it just depends on the individual body and how much gravity it has but ultimately it's going to be pretty hard for most stuff to escape unless it's it's very explosive um like we find on Enceladus or something well plus the moon has a stronger gravity anyway than probably yeah. many of those other moons our moon is one of the bigger moons in the whole solar system we got a badass moon for for how small <laughs> earth is right so yeah <laughs> <laughs> Our moon can take your moon. Any day of the week. Meet me outside. We'll meet you out, meet in the parking lot behind the school, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. So I, I think that's all the time we have for questions, but I want to get some a, a final reflection from you, Natalie. Uh, much of what you describe in the questions that related to life, um, it sounds like we're looking for life as we know it. And is it, in the end, wouldn't that be highly restrictive? Um, can, is there a way to look for life as we don't know it? The thing is, we still know that everything in the solar system and the universe has to adhere to the laws of physics and chemistry as we understand them. So it always doesn't make sense to start looking for life in some other elementary form that, you know, doesn't make any sense for the way that we understand science. But it doesn't mean that another solvent like methane or something couldn't actually host life. So we are looking not just at places that have liquid water, but for example, Titan, which is a moon of Saturn, we're, we're looking at that because it has water, but it's also got a methane cycle. So instead of a hydrological cycle, it's got um, rivers and, and rain of methane um, that, that comes and goes and it has clouds that form. So it's this active environment, but it isn't water necessarily that we think the life could be surviving on, but this is all organic based stuff. So I, I got it. So liquid water might be an unnecessary assumption. Maybe it's just liquid of some yes. kind. That is you, the you definitely need variable. a liquid to be able to move things around. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, organic material needs to be able to move and, and find other bits of organic material and to create, you know, the basic forms of life. So without a liquid, you're going to really struggle. Mm -hmm. um, but even in a really icy environment, there's always going to be some liquid at like, you know, the edges of, of glaciers or whatever it might be. So there's always the potential, um, but we don't necessarily need water, we don't think, but we know that water works because we We've seen it happen here so that's where we're initially looking but yeah you know there could be life based on other forms of things that we don't currently understand but it doesn't make sense to go and look for that because we need to start with what we know and and then work out from there because there's too many you know it would just be crazy to start looking for things we won't wouldn't know how to recognize it or detect it if it didn't look like stuff that we understand okay so paul i think she's just trying to prevent people from investigating her basement there that's I, that, I, that I, answer really. so that's all the time we have natalie it's been a delight to have you back uh, I forgot how much we missed you uh, uh, <laughs> over COVID, and we're going to reach for you again because the solar system is a never-ending uh, playground of, exactly. of space probes and new hypotheses and the search for life. So thanks for being a guest once again on Star Talk. Thanks for having me. All right, Paul, we'll look for you on the on the Late Show with yep, Stephen Colbert. You'll see me there. Thank you. This has been another episode of Star Talk Cosmic Queries. Neil deGrasse Tyson here. As always, keep looking up.